Child. Disturbers of the Beast. <laughs> uh, representations of Madness in Anglophone. Oh, sorry, brother. Thank you. Thanks for the reminder. Uh, representations of, we are recording here, so that's all this is, not for amplification. Uh, representations of Madness in Anglophone Caribbean literature. Um, we, are, we're, we are mostly here to just relax and enjoy ourselves a little bit. Um, we do have maybe 25 minutes or so worth of uh, comment that we've put together. Um, we have put Professor Joseph's under no obligation to do anything but relax today. Uh, she may, however, uh, be willing uh, to sign your recently purchased books, which, uh, <laughs> which are right here for, uh, for $20. Um, uh, you can deal with me uh, for that. Um, and, uh, and I'm also, uh, uh, I can also tell, which I failed to tell you, George, I wanted to get your money first, um, that uh, those, the few of us who are respondents today, um, we are, the center is gifting you another copy. So uh, you'll have one to give to somebody else, uh, and I'm sure uh, uh, our sister uh, Kelly appreciates the, the effort and the support. She will be glad to know, too, that when she, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Kelly, when, when she went to Amazon the other day, uh, there were, you know how they, 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 they say only four copies left or whatever? She says, there's only one copy left. And, and there was a good reason for that, because I got down first and I bought up all the other ones. So uh, so the, the stuff is moving. Come on in, Nick. Good to see you, partner. All right. Uh, so the, the, the product is moving, uh, and uh, more important, the analysis is, uh, is getting out there. Um, we also, uh, just a couple of people that I want to thank uh, in absentia, I believe, I think he's trying to bust up here, is Kashfi Fahim, uh, who um, not only has uh, put together uh, all of the flyers uh, and the publicity material for this, which he, as he routinely does, I, dare I say we make some of the best flyers on campus. Uh, he's a, a real artist, and uh, we appreciate his, his contribution so much. He also uh, assisted me, a la the Apollo 13 mission uh, via text in the middle of the night uh, a couple nights ago to get this music onto a, a proper disc or something I could play here or something at least that I would understand and uh, and so the reason that the music is uh, is present uh, is because of him uh, so we thank him very much the other reason the music is here is the guy that put the, the mix together for once it was not me it was our brother professor Rishi Nath and uh, he's uh, yeah it's a fantastically relevant uh, uh, playlist I'll be happy to give you uh, a copy if you want it, uh, uh, KJ. Um, and uh, for those of you that didn't get it, at some point you can grab, there's a, a Xerox that he made with the explanations of, um, of why the music, why we're, you're listening to this music today. Um, uh, obvious, madness is such a wonderful uh, theme in, in Caribbean music. Uh, and he has put to, he's just picked out some of, some of the beautiful tracks uh, there. And I'd, I've just asked him to say a quick word uh, about the sounds uh, to get us started here. And, uh, and also those of us, when we do speak, if you wouldn't mind either just can you, do you, Andres? Do you need us to move over here, or is uh, it just where I can see you? Yeah, if you if you wouldn't mind just moving to this side of the room, when only for when you speak or standing in the middle, uh, that would be great. And we'll just hand you this mic so he can record it properly. All right. Uh, thanks, Dr. Nymphy. Um Kelly, congratulations. Uh, so. Uh, I'm a big fan of, 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 I guess, what you call world music, um, and especially English is my own language, so the Anglophone Caribbean is uh, one of the places that, I, that I've turned to for, for many years. So uh, as I was reading Kelly's book and thinking about um, the word you know, mad it's, itself and um, the ideas of madness, it just occurred to me that there were so many... Uh, occurrences of this of this idea so I tried in a couple of days just to go through and cover um, some of the some of the ones that I remembered and so you know what Michael was playing earlier involves music um, so-called chutney music from Trinidad soca music from Trinidad um, and reggae music from reggae and dancehall music from Jamaica primarily and maybe some of the other small islands so um, it uh, it uh, definitely had some resonance with, with some of the things that I'm used to hearing. So that's where we are. Beautiful. Thank okay. you. Yeah, Thanks. This is a great mix. I mean, yeah. uh, I'm probably giving myself a lot of work here, but if any of you want to mix, maybe you can get a hold of me and we'll sort it out. She gets one definitely if she wants one. <laughs> uh, lovely, lovely stuff. Much people in the world, and they're mad, 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 mad. Bacchanal. Carnival is bacchanal. Yes. Mad, 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 right? Uh, yeah, it's uh, just. Uh, who, who is that, by the way? Is the name of the uh, artist crazy? Is, uh, yes. Yeah. Yes, crazy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just. just the, the nun for a sister. 
Really? Really interesting. <laughs> How did that sort out? <laughs> That's why <you're> crazy. <laughs> Maybe the nun's the crazy one, you know, who, who knows? Uh, but that's that's actually, I'll, I'll launch in because uh, my my little portion of this is Kelly's introduction. We've, we've sort of split up her book, uh, the, the chapters of her book. Um, and uh, the uh, she even, she opens the book to do like the sound of music and start at the very beginning, right? Um, and she opens with a wonderful epigraph, little poetic epigraph from Paul Keynes Douglas. Uh, Yesterday I was mad, A-H, right? I was mad, 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 mad. New line. Mad, 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 mad. Stark, raven, mad. And then, uh, and in the, uh, the, the line from Crazy in the song comes up here in, in Kelly's introduction uh, in a nice way. Um, uh, Paul Keynes Douglas, Rhythmic, rhythmic repetition illustrates both the complexity and the consistency with which literary artists appropriate madness to represent Caribbean life. The poem reveals the ambiguity of the term mad as each repetition confuses rather than enlightens the reader. Just think about, you know, mad is good and bad, right? Confuses rather than enlightens the reader. The poet leaves his audience to ask not only why the speaker was mad, but also what he means by mad. Is mad the same as mad mad and mad mad mad? <laughs> By the end of the piece, the reader can infer that the speaker was temporarily insane during the bacchanal of Carnival and has now come to his senses. Throughout the poem, Douglas repeatedly plays with the performative aspects of losing one's mind, using the slippages between insanity, anger, and excessive gaiety to recreate the physical and mental experience of Carnival. All right, now that's how she launches in. Um, and uh, just two quick things I want to say uh, about this introduction and, and about the book. Um, and the first thing, you, you got a sense of it there, um, is uh, many, many times uh, works of scholarship, even very good works of scholarship, uh, how can I put this? Um, nicely are not written by good writers <laughs> the uh, yeah they and 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 they often are very useful and, and excellent books uh, but it, it's a real pleasure when someone combines the two um, you even got from from those sentences there one more I'm gonna read right now Kelly can write she has a beautifully sensitive prose I, I it's it's a it's that kind of prose that creates an intimate relationship with the reader uh, as you move through the pages and it, it's very rare it's very rare and I, I just I remember I think the first uh, thing that we read uh, of yours Kelly was uh, uh, your dream on Monkey Mountain uh, she submitted we, a few of us in this room were on her search committee <laughs> that, that brought her here to brought her to us here at York and uh, and we all noticed that right from the start that this is a writer she She's an excellent scholar, a very thorough and careful scholar, but she's also a delicate, sensitive writer. Um, and I think one of the, uh, the it's worth saying, you know, to, uh, uh, in, in this discussion, one of the uh, uh, e uh, lovely examples of that is when she's sort of sorting out how she's, her own definition or decision not to specifically define the, uh, the word mad. Um, and it's here in this, this paragraph. I think you'll enjoy this. And I... I well, I'll say that. This continuum of crazy is magnified when one turns to the discursive usage of the word mad. In fact, I rely more on the term mad than on crazy because, the former, because of the former's multiple meanings. The Oxford English Dictionary lists 14 definitions for mad when used as an adjective with an additional seven entries for the verb, noun, and adverb forms. I refrain from attempting my own definition of madness because the term's plurality provides fertile ground for literary analysis. Any such attempt to circumscribe the term would, in any case, be destined for failure because it constantly resists and subverts imposed limits. Mad also has a wide range of meanings in Caribbean usage. To return to the Paul Keynes Douglas poem that opens this introduction, mad can equal angry, crazy, and even happy. It can be both derogatory and desirable, both criticism and condemnation, and, co and commendation, and commendation. The recognition of these various meanings of mad can also be read in the various phrases used to avoid using the term at all. Whether conscious or not, and whether motivated by political or social motives or not, phrases such as lost her head, or touched, or a little different, indicate a related range of meanings and a similarly complicated nomenclature surrounding abnormal behavior. I love that sentence, Kelly, I love that sentence. The linguistic variation surrounding madness as both term and concept makes it simultaneously extensive and 
elusive. Now, I'm almost forgetting about the content of that when I'm reading it. I mean, I, I, does James Baldwin ring a bell? I mean, it's just, uh, it's just some beautiful writing, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and I think that, uh, that paragraph is worth uh, throwing into, into our discussion today. Um, lastly, real quick, uh, uh, Kelly's analysis rests in a nice place. Uh, uh, I think a, a good place, a correct place. Um, the, uh, the moment those 20-ish years between 1959, I think you start, and uh, through 1980, uh, when the Caribbean was severing uh, itself in, in so many important ways from England, the Anglophone Caribbean, but, uh, but it wasn't just the Caribbean, it was all over the world. Um, revolutions, uh, revolutionary states in Africa, Latin America, uh, Asia, across the Asian continent uh, in those, those post-World War II decades uh, that have, have given us the soul of, of being black and, and and brown uh, in uh, in in this new world, this new globalized world uh, that we're that we're in here today in the 21st century. Um, Kelly's analysis rests in the uh, the problems and promise of um, of the the moment of independence uh, and the 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 aftermath of that uh, and the the flowering of Caribbean literature uh, that uh, that 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 was produced during those uh, those crucial years, those crucial two decades in the 1960s and the 1970s. Um, she, she never allows her reader to forget the political context of her analysis. Um, madness is absolutely political. Uh, ideas about madness are absolutely political. And that's the part that I appreciate the most uh, out, of, uh, out of Kelly's book. So I will turn it over. Let's go in order. Um, uh, let's see, first, um, uh, Man Man, right, was the first chapter. Is that correct? Um, uh, so uh, uh, Ni um, uh, Naipaul's, uh, for uh, Dan, McGee of the English department has agreed to respond to Kelly's chapter on Naipaul. Um, and if I'm you could, supposed to you can either here. stand or sit here, whatever you okay. want to be comfortable. If you'd like to stand, don't um, <clears throat> Well, yeah, so sorry, I, I'm not Naipaul, so <laughs> um, it's not a, perhaps as exciting a response as it might have been. I didn't realize I was going to be holding a microphone, so I have some notes here. Um, because uh, Professor Josephs makes so many, um, uh, so many interesting arguments and readings of literature in this in the first chapter of her book, which is on um, the early work of V.S. Naipaul, Trinidadian uh, novelist. Um, and I guess I'd start where Professor Namphy left off. Um, Kelly does. A uh, kind of a amazing job of of um, of explaining and showing how madness uh, in Caribbean literature. Well, 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 first of all, that it's this kind of central trope or motif that recurs over and over again, and that its significance um, has has to be understood sort of through um, its historical uh, context. Um, um, and then, uh, um, but at the, and, and at the same time, though, I want to stress that um, that she also gives kind of brilliant readings of uh, these novels or works of literature as as literature, and they're and they're not two separate projects. They're kind of. Um, uh, um, situate sit, uh, historical understanding of the literary project and the formal analysis of the literature. She brings them together in, in really successful ways. Uh, so, for instance, in her discussion of Nepal's uh, early work, Miguel Street, at one point she she um, she discusses a kind of general critical. Um, uh, view of this work as, if not a failure, uh, as one of Naipaul's weaker works, um, and the and the you know the one of the main criticisms you being heard is that it's somehow a failed novel. It's it's this collection of different, uh, well, that's the whole question: different stories or different chapters um, that both do and don't seem to add up to a novel. They don't seem like completely separate stories. You can't call it a collection of stories because not only are they all related in being about, you know, uh, peop the people who are living on this uh, street in Port of Spain, 
but they also tend to go in chronological order. They have a unified narrator and so on. And yet, um, it also doesn't seem to be a novel. Um, and Kelly, though, uh, makes a really original point, which is um, that it's pers that that to view that as a flaw is precisely wrong. Because in fact, um, and tell me if I'm wrong, Kelly, but I, I don't think she gives a name for what it is. But she argues that that it's kind of a, that it's a, its own genre, or that it's, um, or that the aesthetic work Naipaul's doing is precisely uh, that, the, that the way in which the, the uh, work eludes kind of this generic um, definition is connected to its representation and concern with the theme of madness in the novel. Um, and uh, uh, I, so to quote um, Kelly's book, which probably, which here puts it much more succinctly and clearly than I just did, the form of McGraw Street exemplifies the community it represents. Um, uh, so, um, uh, So I think um, that uh, that on the one hand, that's uh, um, a strength of her uh, readings of of Nepal that that um, deserves comment, and then um, also just to expand on what uh, Michael talked about in the introduction. Um, uh, just her, her close readings and the way they bring out the kind of multiplicity of significance of madness in in uh, in these different works um, and the way um, uh, the way on the one hand um, the way uh, the the meaning of madness in these uh, say in Miguel Street or the mimic man can't be separated from its historical context, um, that, that the history, um, is, that understanding something about the history of post-World War II, um, the Caribbean world, is necessary to understanding the particular meaning of, of madness in the work. Um, but at the same time, right, uh, she, she also shows that the that the reverse is true. That um, that close readings of sort of the of the specific form that the madness of different characters, such as this character Man Man, takes that these um, give us insights into um, into Nepal's take on the political and social situation. Um, and uh, just to give you a, a concrete sense of what I'm talking about in an abstract way, um, page 27. Um, uh, Kelly talks about, um, at one point, I think she, uh, um, I think she's uh, quoting uh, Glissant here, but she talks about, uh, madness as, um, I forget the exact term she uses, but as a kind of coping mechanism or response to anguish. But then she, and then she goes on though to kind of specify the, the historic, the, the um, form that this anguish takes. Um, and she connects it to the, the uh, kind of social and political upheaval created in the period of decolonization. Um, uh, Americanization and decolonization, um, uh, and then the, the this central character, uh, Man Man, right? She says, uh, Man Man, the designated madman of the street, most vividly reflects the complexities and confusion of these years. In the latter half of um, uh, and. Um, and that in this way, Nepal highlights 
the negative effects of of basically the um, the Americanization the, uh, the, of of uh, Trinidad that comes uh, that begins with World War II and um, the kind of a historical and social upheaval created. So. Uh, I recommend it also as just a general introduction to um, to uh, you know post World War II Caribbean literature. It's it's definitely not a work that's kind of just narrowly focused on this topic of madness. Um, she shows that it's really a, a central to understanding the literature of the period. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much, partner. Thanks so much. And please feel free, please do it quietly, but feel free to grab food as we're talking. There's no reason we, uh, we can't do that. Um, and uh, Dean Chirico, uh, uh, Provost Melites, you've uh, joined us as well. If there is a word you'd like to say at any point, you can just cut in, okay, and uh, let us know, let me know, and I'll, uh, Holger Henke is here as well. Thanks for coming. Uh, we, got, we got colleagues from all, all walks of Univ York College uh, life here, so uh, we're very pleased that you all took the time. Uh, to show up as well. Um, and uh, we also have, um, uh, uh, I should say, it, uh, well, I'll do that in a second. Uh, we also have, of course, some of uh, Professor Joseph's students here. And, uh, and I think uh, Sylvia Winters, the second chapter, right? So we'll keep going in order. And uh, uh, Othello, Can I say a word by all means. Oh, the yeah. first, the first chapter as well? Yeah, um, so I just wanted to, because th this is the only chapter I can say anything about, so. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I thought you were, uh, oh, no, no. I thought you and George were battling over Walcott. No, 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 I, I haven't read Walcott, actually, so, yeah. Yeah. To, to, uh, uh, what do you, uh, uh, co-respond. Yeah, 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 I'm responding, I'm responding to the respondent. <laughs> and if you could just step to the other side. Uh, well, I'll just turn this way, if that's all right. Um, so I, I won't say too much, but I will say that um, I am, I've read a lot of Naipaul's work, and um, I was fascinated by this chapter. Um, it, it recalled, so one of his one of his novels, Away in the World, um, I think from the 80s, uh, has a has a passage in which he the the narrator is recounting. Um, uh, 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 he's fictionalizing an exchange between uh, him and uh, a character who can easily be understood as C.L.R. James, the famous Trinidadian writer and Marxist, um, who was older than Naipaul and for a time was somewhat of a mentor, although that was short-lived. Um, and and in the exchange, uh, the 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 uh, the narrator of of the novel uh, says that that CL, that the C.L.R. James character writes to him. Uh, and, and sort of says that what um, what you're doing in your in your work is actually capturing the lives of people who are being um, whose who, whose whose existence is being kind of torn asunder by forces much much larger than them, and you're sort of recovering um, their 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 the meanings in you know the the meanings and the and the tumult of their lives, and the, but but the sort of validating their existence, and for the for the right Writer, the narrator, the Naipaul character, this this uh, revelation is actually quite new to him. He he hasn't thought of his work in that way, and that's what brings them together. And as I was reading um, uh, uh, this chapter that Kelly's done, I, I think she's actually doing a lot of the same kind of excavation and finding um, finding. Uh, 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 sort of the uh, r helping to recover the importance of the uh, of the of the lives of the characters that are in in this work, and I'll just read a small passage. Um, she says, uh, Naipaul writes later in the middle passage that neuroses affect communities as well as individuals, particularly when there is the need for a re resistive development of a psychology of survival. And she goes on to say, we may read back from this assertion to interpret the communal reliance on repetition in Miguel Street as part of a psychology of survival in the face of inscrutable yet pervasive influence 
of colonialism on the very details of their lives. And then after talking about uh, Edward Glissant's uh, theory, she ends the, uh, the, the paragraph by saying, madness becomes a method of managing the mental anguish, as, as Mickey said, that exists at every turn in colonial society. The Miguel Street sketches are snapshots of these daily existences, each repeating their own forms of resistance to mental anguish. And that's her work. I mean, she's, she, you know, she's citing, on, uh, citing other people uh, and the authors themselves, but that's her conclusion. And I think it's extremely important and valuable um, and helped me. And I think uh, is continuing the kind of analysis that CLR James was doing. Um, before I turn it back to Michael, I would just also like to say, I mean, uh, you know, there's a, in, in this world, you know, we're seeing a lot of information coming from administration and other places warning us of predatory journals. And there's a lot of opportunities where people can get their work out there without much scrutiny. And I think that there's a place for that. And 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 and, and there, there might, you know, the the, the less predatory versions of that might have a place in, in, the, ac in, in the academy. However, um, I would like to note that this, this, this work is a, is a major work, and it's uh, been very thoroughly vetted. Um, and University of Virginia Press is, is, a, is a very serious and competitive press. And this series is in the New World Studies series. And I think it's quite an affirmation, not only of Kelly, but of your college, that one of our colleagues uh, was able to um, find a home for her work in such a uh, important collection. So that, that's what I'd like to say. Thanks. Yeah, uh, beautiful affirmation of uh, of Kelly there, and uh, really, uh, uh, what a what a York College scholar can be. I can't think of any better example than the example that uh, Sister Josephs is setting for us. Uh, really, making York College a place where this kind of analysis can be put forward at the highest levels, as you say. What so. was it that Manon had set you? Yeah, um, I can I can share a couple of a uh, couple people weighed in who weren't able to get here, and. Uh, Okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll get to Manon in a minute. <laughs> Kelly students, uh, several of Kelly students are here, and uh, and Othello Worm has agreed to uh, to say a, a brief word about the second chapter dealing with uh, Sylvia Winters, the Hills of Hebron. Othello, hi. Um, I have the second chapter. Um, it's called the Necessity of Madness. I'm just going to read what I wrote. <laughs> Chapter 2, the necessity, of ma uh, the necessity for Madness, examines the role of insanity in Sylvia Winter's The Hills of Hebron. The novel was originally written as a play, however, in 1962, the year Jamaica achieved its independence, Winter decided to reformat the story as a novel. She does this to explore the possibilities of the, of the new independent Jamaica. Professor Joseph cautious, cautiously refers to the novel as a national allegory as the story follows a newly formed and isolated community, Hebron. The leaders of the community are labeled as crazy. However, their insanity enables them to reimagine without hesitation new social and political structures. In the first section of the chapter, Contesting Colonial Conceptions, Professor Joseph shows how insanity can break colonial paradigms. She alludes first to Alexander Bedward, a real-life religious uh, Jamaican leader who wins over followers by promising them a reversal of roles in heaven. Thus, the oppressed will be the oppressors and vice versa. Thing is, Bedward isn't crazy or daring enough to create his own separate religion apart from the colonizers. Now, returning to the hills of Hebron, the original leader, Moses, while imprisoned, is inspired by an alcoholic doctor and creates a god in his own image. Professor Joseph points out that these two minds that colonial society have deemed mad and marginal are able to see and say things that accepted members of society can't. In the next section, col collective and individual madness Professor Joseph illustrates how madness holds the Hebron community together. In the novel, madness isn't taboo. 
The leaders are seen as mad and their followers, the new believers, revere them for their insanity. Professor Joseph says madness acts as both a shelter and a triumph over life and that the Hebron society accommodates all varieties of madness and all of which excite different reactions in the people. Because of this, both leaders and people of both leaders and the people of Hebron share in in some form a ma in some form of madness, allowing for complete faith and devotion. In the third section, Mad Hopes and Gendered Visions of Community, Professor Joseph discusses the integral role of women in the Hebron community. She acknowledges that Winter is not, is not seen exactly as a feminist writer and disagrees with this claim. She looks at the character of Aunt Kate and draws a parallel between her and the Hebron community, suggesting that the well-being of Hebron is linked to Aunt Kate. Aside from this metaphorical link, the women of Hebron also carry out the essential everyday task of Hebron. They are the backbone of the community. Professor Joseph suggests that the, the men of Hebron tend to social societal ideas and theory, while the women handle the actual day-to-day -day maintenance. In the final section, the, the utility of madness, Professor Joseph points out that insanity not only allows the transcendence of colonial limitations, but also exposes the restrictions colonialism had set on those sane and sober. Winter condemns anti-colonial thought and champions post-colonial resistance. Professor Joseph gives the example of the character Isaac criticizing his peers who speak of, new, uh, speak of a new constitution and other colonial ideas for their independent Jamaica. However, they can never suggest anything truly revolutionary as their minds are trapped in colonial thought. In order to break this barrier, it seems one must be insane, thus the necessity of madness. Thanks, Othello. Much appreciated. Uh, careful, careful reading. Uh, uh, and I will, Kelly, after thanking Othello, pass along uh, just a couple of affirmations sent in via email and what, whatever. Uh, Menon uh, Ahmed, who I don't know if you've personally met yet. We were hoping to introduce you to him here, but he's, he's interested in your work. He looked at a little of your work, and uh, he wrote back to me, and he said, tell Professor Josephs. Good scholar. <laughs> He's the head of the uh, Southeast Asia Institute at Columbia University, uh, and uh, and is becoming a, a good made some connections to us here at York College, and we're very pleased about that. So he weighed in, um, and uh, President Marcia Keys from she said uh, to tell Professor Joseph she's in India right now actually, so uh, um, is not able to be here, but she did say to uh, she said from one Jamaican to another she said congratulations, so uh, she weighed in as well. Um, uh, uh, the, I, I'm sorry, George and Rishi, I should have known, Rishi is, he's a math professor, but he's also a very careful reader of Naipaul, as you can tell, I uh, should have known that we had asked him to respond to the Naipaul chapter. Um, uh, Derek Walcott's Dream on Monkey Mountain is the third chapter, fourth chapter of Professor Joseph's book, and uh, Professor George White from the History Department, Chair of the History Department, has agreed to, uh, to say a word about chapter four. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, before I start, I want to say congratulations to Kelly for um, an outstanding book. Um, and um, in reading it, um, I was blown away. So in my madness, I've cobbled stuff together. I don't know if it's coherent, but uh, if it's not clear, it's my fault, not hers. So, Toward the end of Shakespeare's play, Othello, the title character addresses the men who betrayed him and urges them to remember him as a noble general whose lone fault might have been that he loved too much. In particular, he says to them, I have done the state some service. I'm reminded of this passage because of the remarkable work of Dr. Kelly Baker Josephs in her new book, Disturbers of the Peace. Disturbers of the Peace is well thought out, thoroughly researched, and superbly written. Dr. Josephs uh, informs her critique of Caribbean literature with a sure grasp of Caribbean politics and deep knowledge of revolutionary psychology, among other things. The book accomplishes a number of things, not the least of which is revealing the ways that Caribbean authors used the metaphor of insanity to demystify power. 
Chapter four of the monograph addresses Derek Walcott's award-winning play, Dream on Monkey Mountain. In brief, the play revolves around the character Macaque, who is imprisoned and interrogated by a colonial officer, Colonel Lestrade. Macaque claims to have been visited by a moon spirit who told him that his destiny was to become an African king. Lestrade, the other prisoners, and even Macaque's best friend, Mustique, think that Macaque is crazy. The play unfolds as Macaque, Mustique, and Lestrade make physical and spiritual journeys that lead to transformations both profound and profane. Specifically, Dr. Josephs illuminates the ways in which Walcott uses madness or insanity as a glue to bind people together in order to understand their world and to change it. It may seem odd to imagine that hallucinations can provide clarity, but Dr. Josephs persuasively argues that Walcott did exactly that. More to the point of the wonderful introduction to Disturbers of the Peace, our author draws out the various levels of Walcott's madness. To my untrained eye, there are several layers to Walcott's madness as elucidated by Dr. Josephs. As part of this larger discussion, I will only focus on three. First, it must be said that any society founded at the intersection of white supremacy, patriarchy, and capitalism, among other ills, is by its nature insane. <laughs> what Dr. Josephs teases out through her keen eye is that the insanity of Western societies creates a particular order. Illogical, immoral, and contradictory it may be, but it is an order. Accordingly, Anyone who challenges or troubles the societal status quo must be insane. Insane to be able to see through the gauze of supposed normalcy, insane to name it, and insane to try to fix it. This level of madness reminds me of something Martin Luther King once said. King remarked that if America's definition of a well-adjusted person was someone who tolerated abuse and injustice all around them, then he would prefer to be considered maladjusted. <laughs> At a second level, Walcott's multiple definitions of sanity and reality also seem to muddy the very idea of free will. Using Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth, our author reminds us that the maintenance of the power relationship between oppressor and oppressed rests, in large part, on the consent of the oppressed. It is the colonizer who always demands that the colonized, in this case the people of the Caribbean, exist in the spaces between two worlds. Through Walcott's characters, he suggests that madness thrives in the gulf between the supposedly civilized Western world and the supposedly uncivilized poverty stricken third world. Through the inductive lens of Dr. Josephs, Walcott's play questions whether or not the oppressed resist their oppression out of volition or out of a compulsion to stop the incoherence of their existence. At a third level, Dr. Joseph's analysis points out Walcott's insistence that his play be interpreted and reinterpreted by each subsequent director or theater company. The play's shifting meanings seems to be a response to Fanon's warning that revolutionaries should not withdraw into the twilight of past African culture. Dr. Joseph's interpretation shows that the lead character, Macaque, actually loses his potency as a transformative prophet the moment he becomes a king. At the same time, the lack of sanity in Dream on Monkey Mountain also bridges the gulf between language and action, artist and audience. In keeping with Fanon, Dream on Monkey Mountain reminds the wider audience that freedom cannot come from simply inverting the hierarchies that currently enslave us. As well, Walcott may be suggesting that the oppressed should know that there is no perfect freedom, that change is the order of nature. Ultimately, Dr. Joseph's critique shows us that struggle is constant and in many ways is its own reward. In her skillful hands, madness flows like unforgiving water over, under, around, and through social stratification, illusions of respectability, and rabid individualism. Dr. Joseph's analysis urges us to keep fighting even as the sand shifts under our feet. If humanity is a collective state, then Dr. Joseph has done us a tremendous service. Thank you. How, how you feel now? <laughs> that is really lovely. Yeah, that, yeah, that, that last couple of paragraphs. He, he was inspired. You know how when, when we're writing, we're, we're inspired by the person we're critiquing. You know, he was taken right up off of Kelly's. Uh, yeah, good stuff, George. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Um,
just one other thank you here that I need to extend is to uh, Marcia Comrie and Andres uh, for uh, for coming out and, and filming this and for Marcia for covering it. Uh, what is the actual name of the public information? Is that the... Um, Institutional advancement. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Institutional advancement. <laughs> and uh, Andres, is yours from uh, technically EdTech or? Uh, yes. Yeah, from EdTech. All right. So thanks a lot. And it's great to meet you, by the way. We'll see you around campus. Um, you, you all know this is Women's History Month. And uh, you will also have noticed that it's all men uh, responding to the. <laughs> Yeah, I, I told I, I told Kelly uh, uh, a couple of days we tried, you know. <laughs> um, but uh, 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 maybe I can put it this way: uh, maybe it's a good thing that us men are are trying to wrestle with this uh, this stuff, uh, and and maybe that can have just as much effect <laughs> dealing with the group that's the problem rather than the group that's uh, the victim of male supremacy, right? Um, uh, but thank God for Alana Duguid, uh, who is also uh, one of Professor Joseph's students, and uh, and is gonna gonna take us home here uh, our last respondent dealing with uh, the fifth chapter on Irma Broadburg and I, I always it's the one novel one work that I uh, that you critique that I haven't read I confess and I always forget the name of the uh, the novel what is it Alana uh, um, Lucy and um, Jane and Louisa will soon come home Jane and Louisa will soon come home Alana do good folks <laughs> Um, I have to correct Professor Nanfi on my last name. It's not do good. It's actually do good. I guess people assume that I do good, but I, <laughs> I don't. I've been my students for three years. <laughs> That's really bad. Uh, I apologize. It's fine. It's fine. You're good in your class. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. Uh. The mo the chapter that called to me most it was the last one. The title is um, Claims to Social Identity, because I felt that she did a great job in um, identifying that there is not a separation between your culture and history and whatever you experienced. And I guess I should, since she used the um, myth Kubla, I guess I should tell you guys what that is, what I interpret it to mean from what she wrote. And um, to me, the Kumla is, well, I guess you would say it's a myth, but for Neely, the central character in um, in the text that she um, analyzed, the Kumla was um, a part of her, is like, was a protective and a constraining, um, like, magical being that it would protect her and also like prevent her from identifying who she was as an individual. And in reading that, um, yeah, I, co I kind of connected it to connected it to Min has um, woman native other, which she also spoke about, but a different text I believe that she spoke about Min has. And I said um, Min has woman native other ties together the important place history and culture have in one's recognition of their identity and in this case their social ident social identity. So then Neely's identity. Neely's identity then lies with a broader community and not just the community of her family. And I quote, her family and not just the, um, her family serves as the base of her identity. The history of Jamaica and the culture which was mentioned, the, the culture which is the, um, the Kumla, prevented Neely from seeing or categorizing herself as a single being, meaning there is no linear perspective to who she, who she is as an individual. Thus, Neely's search for her identity requires the acceptance of history and culture. To, for Neely to, to look at Neely's madness, you need to look at her sociological experience. And I thought that um, Professor Joseph did a great job in showing that because you are, you are, um, you have this multi idea of who you are, right? You have all oh, like, okay, I'm Jamaican, but I'm also from somewhere else because of all these people that kind of invaded my country and they kind of took over. I'm also, <laughs> I'm also, <laughs> I'm also connected to them as well. So for her, her madness comes from her complexity of not identifying who she is at the, as this individual. So um, I kind of. Um, took a hold of that because for me personally, I guess you could, I could look at it as a person perspective as well. For me personally, I'm Caribbean as well, and you guys, certain, you guys sometimes forget that Guyana is part of the Caribbean, <laughs> even though we are in South America. You guys certainly kind of forget that. <laughs> so for me as an individual, I feel like 
I can connect to Neely's experience of what she was, ex what she, what she went through as well. So that's why I chose that chapter. And short but sweet. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Alana. Uh, those those are the those are the, the folks that we've scheduled for this, and we we can bring it to a close. But if anybody does have a, a comment you'd like to make, one more thank you I should give is to Brother Irwin here. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, you know all this setup and all of that. He uh, he takes care of this. He's always so willing, and uh, and we appreciate it, Irwin. Thanks so much. Um, uh, welcome, brother. How you doing? Thank you. All right, all right. Um, uh, is there if there is any comment anybody would like to make, uh, please feel free to to kick in. I don't know, Kelly, if you wanted to respond at all. Uh, if, I'll finish out. Please, yes, that'd be great. Has something to say before I finish out? Okay, cool. Um, it's just a thank you, really. <laughs> um, it's always great to have people actually read <laughs> what you write, because <laughs> you know you sit in a room somewhere and 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 write it and hope that someone might read it. Um, and and it's been getting great response, but it's so much better to have it in the room with you um, and to have your colleagues and students, um, which was a great surprise, um, reading and commenting. Um, uh, my mom called me maybe two, three weeks ago and said, I finished. And I wanted to say, I can see why you called it work. Because uh, I think she thought I was playing um, all these years. Um, so that was like the top review for me when my mom finished the book and wanted to call and tell me. Um, and this comes right there after it. <laughs> so, sorry, I can't, I can't put you above my mom. Um, so this is a great moment as well um, in the reception of, of this product that I have um, created. Um, I wanted to say a few things before the specific thank yous. Um, the, the cover, um, I had to fight a bit f to get what I wanted um, for the cover because um, representing, and, and we're talking about representations of madness, representing madness is, is always so tricky. And, and what do you put as an image um, when you're talking about madness? And, and the artist um, um, who does this is uh, Hugh Locke. Um, he is a Guyanese artist. Um, Guyanese British. Um, he lives in England now. And, and this is actually a huge, um, this is like the floor of, and that's the ceiling. And it's, it's all black beads on a wall. And it's a whole room. Um, no longer exists, but it was a whole room, um, I think, in the London Museum. Um, and so I wanted to capture the sort of um, militancy of madness as well as the ephemeral sort of um, uh, uh, fantastical bit of madness and, and, and the, the, the various strains that come into madness for me and, and in the text that I, I um, examine. So I wanted to just draw attention. It's called The Nameless and it's, it, there's, this is just one motion moment in a whole room of it. Um, so that's part of what, for me, uh, encapsulates the book. Another part is what Alana ended with, and the, the personal connection to um, the struggle, both historically, politically, and psychologically, um, of the characters that I wanted to share with, with readers. Um, that, that was what brought me to the work, and I'm happy that someone um, or, or someone's um, saw that in the work. And then to come back to where Dan started with it being sort of an introduction to Caribbean Lit, I see madness as being all over Caribbean Lit, and so I wanted, um, so it does have to have that sort of introductory larger scope um, um, uh, uh, focus perspective. So those were the little things that I wanted to um, sort of respond um, directly to and then to say thank you for the, to the organizers. Um, so Michael for always putting on 
a party, um, and, and to, to Rishi for helping him out um, with with music and and I'm sure food, <laughs> because I have a feeling you had a hand in that. Um, thank and thank you guys for attending in in a busy moment in the semester. Um, Alana and Othello, wow, thank you. And of course, George, you're sending me that because I am putting that on my website <laughs> because uh, someone needs to read that and um, that is good. And and yes, and and you know, Othello, you'll be getting an email as well because yours is written out. Um, and if anyone else who responded like wants to write it out, that would be great. So thank you guys so much. It's such a pleasure to hear the response to my work. Thank you. Yeah.